I was teaching for, gosh, probably about, yeah, it was about 12 years. And I started feeling the slump. I thought I was frustrated because of the students. My niece, who is a brilliant human, I realized things that I was doing in the classroom were the same things that pushed her out. Be back today, and I'm like, super excited for our guest today. Honestly, um, hey. I, think I, but I'm... I know I'm reading a little bit about her and everything just to kind of get to know her a little more before I actually get to know her. Um, I'm really excited to see what we talk about and kind of hear some stories and everything. She's so good, like, she's so good and she's so fun. And I just I want that energy on our show, so. Yeah. I, what we're looking for. If anyone wants to come on, we have a link in our bio. We have the link in the bio <laughs> calling all educators, mental health professionals, people who just want to chat with us. If you want to be on the show, we do have a link in the bio. That was a good plug. <laughs> that was good. I'm trying to be better. <laughs> I'm put it in. On our show to yeah. chat with us, obviously. And also, if you have topics that you want us to talk about as well. Even if you don't want to be on, we can talk about that. That is what. Comment them down below, or you, we also have a link in our bio. Because the show is for the people. The show is for you. So yeah. when, if you want to talk about it, let us know. And we will be here, ready to chit chat. So while we wait um, on the more people to join, Let's give a quick recap about last week's episode. Yeah, our first one, that was so exciting. Honestly, it, it just, it kind of feels like surreal that it happened, you know, that we kind of started this. Cause like we said last time, we've been talking about this for so long and for it to actually get started and for people to be joining and seeing new faces all the time. It's, it's really exciting. I new account that they can't see their faces, but. <laughs> I know, but we saw, well, we can't actually see the people, but we can see them pop in and pop out. <laughs> hey, Pam. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I know, last week's episode was really good. I was really glad that Charlie got to stop by and help us with the kickoff. Um, and the foundation piece, because dignity is really the foundation of our mission, our the work that we do and it just centers everything so i thought that starting off with charlie oh charlie just joined I know, the perfect time they were talking about <laughs> you know like what we say here and yeah. like, like your ears are ringing like his ears yeah, his nose. <laughs> yeah. i mean but, it's better to who start off the the line with the then, the okay, right <laughs> so yeah. i was glad that he got to join us and um if you missed last week's episode it is on youtube already so go watch it subscribe to our youtube channel and definitely share it with your friends um yes. please send a text message let everybody know we're here we're live and if you miss it it's okay because we're going to upload on youtube every week so that's good well it's 707 so i think I think we should just go ahead and get started. We got quite a few people in the room already. Um, and tell people they can come late. It's okay. It's not like school where you get in trouble for being tardy. Like, it's come as you can. Yeah. <laughs> so, I want to get started with, what can we call this, Jasmine? The Tweet of the Week, I guess? Yeah. We'll, we'll come up with a more clever name, but for now, Tweet of the Week. Tweet of the Week, okay? So, the Tweet of the Week that we found this week, that was so fitting. Well, I thought it was so fitting for the for this episode. Um, the person, his Twitter name is at Sage underscore Stage. So shout out to you at Sage underscore Stage. Um, but he is an educator, and he said, after school meeting to go over data and think big picture. But after a full day of work, my brain is just mush. 
couldn't tell you whether plan A or plan B, plan B would be more effective. The kids probably wouldn't do it either way, and I want to go home. And honestly, I have never, well, I've seen some other tweets that are, like, very relatable and, like, real. But that was, like, super just authentic and real because I can remember when I was a teacher and you taught all day and then you get maybe 10, 20 minutes to kind of take a deep breath and sit down and then having to go straight to a meeting <laughs> about data and how can we support kids with data and it's like oh my gosh like I just spent the day as a referee trying to you know navigate all these crazy um social dynamics that are going on with my students and I'm tired and I just want to eat I just want to go to sleep but I gotta go to look at data so yeah. and then I feel like go home and and i I'm not a teacher, so I, I guess you can kind of talk more on this, but to go home and kind of have to grade papers and figure out the next day's like lesson plan and everything, I feel like it just kind of feels like it's never a break. It's a never ending cycle, which is funny because we saw another reel, like, you know, we, we said tweet of the week, but we actually have a tweet and a reel. And the reel said that um, teachers think what did it say, Jess? I don't even know. Yeah, it said um, <laughs> they have more thoughts per second or thoughts per minute um, than a brain surgeon. Yeah, 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 yeah. They're like more exhausted at the end of the day, which that's insane. I know. And the crazy part is they don't equivalent, you know, teachers and no. brain surgeons on the same schedule, on the same scale. Yeah. But honestly, like the amount of times you stop like you have to have so many different things going on in your brain like you said what lesson am I teaching next how do I get this kid to sit down <laughs> what yeah. am I gonna eat when do I get to sit down so questions like when can I go to the restroom like you know like your brain is constantly going when you're a teacher and well and you I feel like you can't stop you know what I mean you want to break and you have kids like to deal like not deal with I feel like that kind of sounds bad but you have you have all these things that you have to do and if you don't then in a way you're not doing your job and so I feel like it it's kind of just like a lose-lose situation sometimes sometimes, <laughs> sometimes but it's you know you have to have a heart for it for it, surely yeah and shout out to all our educators because you you know you wouldn't be there if you didn't have the heart for it so so yeah. glad that we have these teachers that are equivalent to brain surgeons Helping our our group. And you know, we talked about these tweets today and they sent you the brain and you know what better way than to introduce our guest for today who literally knows so much about the brain. Yeah, <laughs> what doctor and I, you know, I, I told her before we got on this call, like we didn't put your doctor title on our on our um announcement and i'm so sorry yeah. she was you know she she knows her stuff and she yeah. is private. so <laughs> dr missy Whitman, um it come on in come on into the chat she's already on here so she'll be joining us in just a second and we're gonna go from there so excited to talk with her i'm excited to meet her and again brought up me highlight the doctor part again because we will add that next time when the recap and everything. <laughs> she did work hard for that, so. She did. And, you know, she is, she knows a lot about it. Trust me. Like, we thought we had some, had, have had many conversations about it. Oh, here she is. She's here. Hello, Missy. I need, like, a round of applause, a uh, round of applause for her. She's <laughs> here. Hello, welcome to the chat. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. This is actually a, a new experience for me. I am actually creating new neural pathways about how to do live chit chats on Instagram. <laughs> so I appreciate the learning. That's what we do every day, right? And this is a perfect example. Anybody who's in there that's never been in here before, there's a learning curve. There's a little productive struggle and we're creating new neural connections. It's so fantastic. Thank you for letting me be here. Thank you for joining us. Yeah. Yes. Did you hear our tweet of the week? 
<laughs> yeah, I love it. <laughs> what do you think about that? Isn't it so true? Because Missy, you know, she was an educator for 20, how many years, Missy? Oh, I, I'm still an still educator, 24 years. Yeah, 24 uh -huh. years. 24 years in the school, though, you yeah. know. And so she can also relate to, like, after that long day and your brain just feeling like, but we got to talk about data. But we got to talk about, you know. <laughs> that's just, you know, that's one of the joys of, you know, serving our youth. <laughs> but so glad great you being here today. Missy, can you just give them a little, I don't want to intro you too much, but can you give them a little intro about who you are and what you do and why you're here today with us? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm a teacher. I've been teaching for 24 years and I, I teach health and fitness. So anything exercise science, PE, health, nutrition, and fitness, how to be a personal trainer, all of that's kind of my area. And um, I was teaching for, gosh, probably about, yeah, it was about 12 years. And I started feeling this lump. And it's a heavy, it's this job, there's a heavy load to this job. And I was really feeling frustrated. And I thought I was frustrated because of the students. And I was kind of getting in this space of, ah, kids these days. And then um, my niece, who is a brilliant human, she um she started struggling in high school and um she got pushed out of the traditional model and she was labeled a dropout i would label her a push out and the um that was the moment for me where i realized one why i was so exhausted and two i realized that all the things the progressive punitive practices the um at that time, there was kind of this push, like, don't get too close to your students, like, you know, you know, the side hug, remember the side hug era, like, side hug era, or don't touch it all, and, and don't, like, <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, it was just, it, it was just kind of a thing where it was like, don't get too close to your students. So anyways, getting back to my niece, I realized that the same things that I was doing in the classroom were the same things that pushed her out. And I remember thinking, how could teachers not see her potential? Like, I, I love that girl. I saw potential the moment she was born. I saw potential. And I, I couldn't believe that they didn't see her potential. But then, you know, you got to look at yourself. And it's like, whoa, I am not seeing the potential of my students. So that's really where it kind of started. And then I read the book Spark by John Rady. If you have not read the book, I'm putting a plug in for you. First three chapters are all neuroscience. And my big push was the exercise piece because that's where my, my area of interest was at the time, still is, but you know, that it, that's where it started for me. And so I read that book and I went, whoa, like education, it needs fitness, it needs physical activity, it needs these things that are real kinesthetic in order for the brain to be engaged in order to do the learning. So now I see it more broadly, not just exercise, exercise is important, and, but I also see it as STEM activities and um, opportunities to sing and play an instrument and do art, all those things that really engage um, the brain in a way that allows for that change that that plasticity that change in the brain to occur which is what we hope happens in our classrooms like that's our role is to grow brains and so um i my the thing with my niece happened then i read that book and i was like okay now i can't i can't unsee what i've seen now um and um then i went to ncce which is a computer conference here in the pacific northwest um a little plug shout out for ncce they do a great job but um i went to a conference and i was teaching about brain breaks because i read the book and i was like now i'm going to teach all teachers how to be kinesthetic in the classrooms so i went and on this the second day I presented on the first day the second day i went to the conference and dr Kiran Omani from University of Washington was presenting with Con McQuinn, who was part of an educational service district. And they were teaching engaging the brain. And it was like, I just, I was planning on going to another session. So 
I like just went straight to the session because I was like, that's it, that's it. So anyway, after that, there were so many things that he explained, especially around stress, that I was like, the light bulbs, right? So I just kept bugging Dr. Romani and he didn't have time for me. I was, I was a teacher. He was, you know, ivory tower at UW doing research and I just kept bugging him. I sent an email, after email, and finally he agreed to have a cup of tea with me. And then that's when we started um, neural education together, doing professional development for teachers. And we're, all of us who are doing the professional development are in education level different, you know, we're in different types of education. We've got, you know, if you care about kids, you can be part of neural ed. Um, but everybody who's in it is they, um, they're educators who are taking the neuroscience and starting to understand the brain and then bringing it into our classrooms with, um, you know, practical brain aligned uh, practices that really help students learn. Wow. Wow, that's that is actually like really beautiful. Um, one, I really admire you having to take that step back and looking in the mirror and saying like, "Man, my niece is getting in so much trouble, but I'm actually doing the things that you know are getting her." And so I commend you for that because a lot of times, here, like at cultures, we have a lot of conversations with educators um, about taking that step back because we all think we're perfect, and, and if we could all be perfect, like. Hey, the world would be great but you know there's sometimes that we do have to stop and reflect and we think we're doing a great job but in actuality there's things that, that we could be doing better um and a lot of times i think our minds automatically go like these kids are just like you said like the kids are making me so tired the kids are draining me out the kids are you know and it's it's not just the kids, but it's sometimes us, the grownups too. Like, what are we doing to support the kids so that we won't get drained out? Like, yeah, it'll take a little bit more work at the beginning to, you know, figure out what's going on. But after we both learn how to play our parts together, like we can really create something beautiful. So thanks for sharing that story. And I know Jasmine, Jasmine, you could probably relate to that too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I was just about to say, I think, it's so important to focus on the teacher, like, you know, the mental side of it and everything, because how can the educator not be okay, but then and try and help the student be okay. You know what I mean? So I think that's, that's awesome that you're kind of focusing on that side, which I don't think is focused on enough. Jasmine, do you think that like, if you didn't have that outlet to be like a student athlete, because I don't know, Jasmine's being humble, but she is literally on the women's soccer team at, the University of Evansville currently right now <laughs> and like that do you think that's a big piece of drive in like you know helping you through like your education do you think so I don't know I could be playing words in your mouth but... no 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 a hundred percent um honestly I, I got really lucky and I have awesome coaches and I have really great professors. I go to a really small school, so it's really easy to kind of build that connection with them. I can't imagine not being on like a name to name basis with all of them. Um, but I can't even imagine not having that, you know, so a hundred percent. And having that outlet to of it. Oh yeah. A hundred percent. And also too, something I got from Missy is like, if you want something, keep budget. <laughs> you know a close what my dad always says a close mouth never gets fed so hey keep on keep on asking so missy let's get into a little bit of like the the vocab okay because we're saying a lot about neuro education and this and that can you explain for the people um how, how what is it like how is that defined in like regular terms in when you see that in schools, what does it what does it look like? Yeah, it's interesting because we've done uh, a lot of research around this area, and one of the things that we found is that um, when we build, when we start with the vocabulary, it's funny that you bring the vocabulary, but when we start with the vocabulary and words, stress, bias, amygdala hijack, 
we talk about prefrontal cortex, amygdala, all of these words that whether you know them or not right now, that's okay. But when we start with the vocabulary, um, then it starts leading us into this area where we start having what we call a neural lens. So for example, um, if we see a student with unexpected behaviors, we could say uh, that kid's a pain in my butt, that kid's a bad kid, that kid can't learn, that kid can't focus, that kid can't sit. We can kind of get into this space where some of the things that we're saying to describe some of the unexpected behaviors really lead into um, to some bias with ourselves, some, some implicit bias with ourselves, and then our brain's always looking for confirmation on everything. So the moment you start going, oh, that kid can't focus, they can't focus. Now you're in a space where that's where your brain is going to seek that out. So what we do is we really teach the neuroscience and teach the language because once we start teaching the language, um, then we start moving into the space that we call the neural lens, right? And the neural lens is like, it's that moment where you can't unsee things, right? So we start framing the behaviors, reframing the behaviors. So instead of uh, that's, that kid can't sit, that kid can't focus, or that's a, you know, bad kids, all the labels that we say about kids, when we, when we move away from that labeling and stratification, and we start really looking at the, the unexpected behaviors and start recognizing, whoa, that's a fight behavior, that's a flight behavior, that's a freeze, that's a fawn, that's a flock behavior. Now we're moving in the space to recognize that's an amygdala hijack. And when a student is an amygdala hijack, they are having a, a brain body experience that is closing their brain for learning. And Dr. Bruce Perry talks about opening the brain for business. And so that's what we do. All right, we can see that brain is closed. And by the way, this is not a student thing. This is a brain thing. So those teachers that are like, I got to do data today after school and I'm exhausted. Yeah, you know why? You, yeah, you, it's hard for you to process this and have big ideas around it because you're, you're in a stress response and your brain is not open in that moment. Now here's the good news. There are things that we can do through connection, through um, really certain supports, like having some certainty in the spaces. There are things that we can do to lower that affective filter, which then opens up the brain in order to be able to bring in this information. So as teachers start getting this neural lens, like it's, you don't just get it, but you know, developing their neural lens, then they start noticing the impact of their practices on the potential of the student. And when we start shifting our practices, um, we are able to invite the student in, we are able to um, look at what is going on on day to day and recognize it not as a good kid, bad kid, but a uh, this is a brain response. And then because we start recognizing it, then we're able to start co-creating solutions to support the student, whatever their needs are. And it's not a strategy. It's not one strategy. It is a lens. And then we start creating structures and supports in our classrooms that meet the needs of that individual kid. And here's the good news. You have one kid who is really struggling to, um, self-regulate. Well, you bring in a structure, a self-regulation structure for that one kid. You provide it as a universal design for all kids. And oftentimes what we find is that those structures that help that one student actually support the learning of our other students as well. I love that. And I love this part, the part about the hijacking. Because it reminded me of something that we even talk about here at Cultures. And I love that you actually have the science behind it. Um, you know, that really makes sense. Because we talk about this concept of emotional hijacking all the time. We talk about educators. And I love how you pointed out how that can lead to bias. And, like, in not intentional bias. Um, especially when you're working with schools. Um, sad to say, but, like, in, like, schools that are like low income or schools with predominantly high population of students with color. Um, there's a lot of implicit bias just 
in society alone that are with those populations of people, those population of students. And as you get, you know, like your, you, what they say, your glitter explodes and you get hijacked and you can't, you know, your emotions in that moment. Like, it's really hard to come back from that. Um, and so I feel like how you pointed out how that is not just a, it's not a student thing, it's a brain. And it's like, yeah, we, we talk about, you know, you know, like that might be a really hard kid. It might be a kid. Um, but having that emotional granularity to really point out, like, how is the, what is the actual behavior that this student is experiencing and why I think it's so important. And I can clearly see how, like, um, the work that we do around dignity can, like, go into this. And I think it's important that people understand social emotional learning is not just breathing exercises. It's not is um you know having a meditation corner but it's actually all of these parts that play a role together it's the science behind why we can't regulate it's the science behind how we get hijacked in those emotions and how it can lead us to start thinking about them in ways that we're not even trying to think about them but it's it's the brain like you said that that is making us um do these things and then how can we help how can we fix it you know um and i think that's a lot where our work comes in with like giving help with solutions on how to think through it but i love how you all's work um helps not only think through solutions but like um in the like physical physical solutions to help teachers think from outside perspectives not just because it's not a one-size-fits-all for all students just like you said and i really appreciate you pointing that out <laughs> for sure so as we get into that a little bit more i'm just curious um well first i won't because i don't know jasmine do you have anything else you want to say about that before i go to the next question yeah yeah and i'm sure later on we'll probably talk about this more um but i liked how you said like destiny said it's a brain thing because i feel like it's oftentimes targeted towards kid but I feel like anyone that can happen to anyone um so both of you could answer too but do you guys have any or know any like specific triggers words behaviors anything to look out for to kind of know like this is happening you know we need to watch for this fix this kind of thing um you know it's interesting we really look at the science and so um thinking about that yes and one of the things that has come out in 2022 um, out of Stanford, Dr. Ian Gottlieb, he was doing research on brain. So let me bring a little research in and then I'll kind of talk about it. But he was doing research on brain and what he wanted to do, he started in 2017 and he wanted to um, determine if there was a key signature that made an adolescent brain. What that means is, is could we look at a picture of a brain and determine this is a 13 year old brain or this is a 15 year old brain. So he um, was doing a longitudinal study. So he was, he had students that were coming in and he was, so this global pandemic happens and he had these pictures of these kids' brains, but he didn't have, he wasn't able to finish it because the variables had changed. So now his research has, has changed, right? That's pretty frustrating if you're doing research. So he um, worked with his team and they were like, okay, what are we gonna do? Are we abandoning the project? COVID happened, right? So they decided, let's do this. Let's see if there's a key signature of the brain pre-COVID and post-COVID. So they started looking at it and actually they did peri-COVID, which is one year post the lockdown. So they were taking pictures of the brain and they were able to match up um, 64 matched pairs um, pre-COVID, post-COVID, or peri-COVID, and they, he matched 64 matched pairs. So they were matched based on um, age, sex, SES, and a um, couple other things. So he matched these kids up and then he was continuing to take pictures of the brains. The research that he, that he, um, that he, that went out in a journal was a 15 year old brain. So the impact of COVID on the 15 year old brain. And there's two main findings that he had that's really interesting. 
he found that there were thinner cortices. So he's found that this part of the brain, which is our executive function, our problem solving, our 21st century skills are right here on the prefrontal cortex. So he said there's the thinning cortices. And he also noticed that there are larger amygdalae. The amygdala, there's two of them, one on either side, the amygdalae, that is the switching station that determines how our body's going to respond to stress. So it's basically going, is it safe? Is it safe? Is it safe? If it doesn't deem something safe, it brings it back. And then we have our, our body and our brain can, it's a medulla hijack, right? So fight, flight, freeze, on, flock. So post COVID, we have larger amygdalae and thinning cortices. Now as a teacher, teachers are coming together and saying, Oh my gosh, what is with kids, right? That's, those are some of the conversations that we're having. We're flocking ourselves. But here's the thing, two things. One, brain is brain. So what we're seeing on that 15-year-old brain is not just a 15-year-old brain. That's all of our brains. It's why we are feeling that, um, that extra tension and stress and anxiety in our classrooms too. And that creates emotional contagion in our spaces. So to be aware of that can really help us kind of like take that deep breath. The second thing, which is really good news, is that the brain is plastic. And he put that in his research too. He says, this is in the short term. Thank you, Dr. Gottlieb, for saying short term. We can change it, but if we're gonna be intentional about changing it, we have to think about what grows plasticity. And here are the things that grow plasticity. This is, a, this is Dr. Marianne Diamond's work. Um, diet, exercise, newness or novelty, um, challenge, as educators, we call it productive struggle, and love. Love we call sense of belonging. Those are the things that grow the prefrontal cortex of the brain. Guess what? As educators, we're really good at those things. For sure. And it's really, since kids spend the most time at school, I think those are the places where we can use a lot of time to build those those things that you just talked about. Like the perfect time, like you spend so much time of the day at school. So why not focus on five things during that time when you have those kids? Um, and I think a lot of times we focus on just like, you know, of course, of course teachers, we want them to succeed in test scores. I saw something that said that ACT scores have been the lowest this past year since like the 70s or the 80s or something like that. But it was like a long time ago. And um, I think, like you said, the brain is plastic and it's so beautiful because we can, um, as educators, support our kids in all five of those different ways um, to make sure that we help them get back on track. COVID was a really scary time for all of us. And although kids have a lot of resilience like I think it's something to you know call out because it was, it was hard for a lot of us we saw a lot of it wasn't it was more than just people getting sick like we saw a lot of, we had a lot of loss and a lot of uncertainty of what was going to happen next and I think we still a lot of us are still holding on to that because you never know if it could or if it will happen again you know so I think thank you for saying that I thought that I think that was one point and I'm I'm glad we got to talk about it yeah um, especially I'm glad you talked about COVID because I feel like a lot of people during COVID were saying I want to get back to normal I want to get back to normal but what normal was like it's going to be a new normal you know like there's never going to be that and I feel like a lot of people didn't realize how much everyone changed during COVID and how we are now that is our normal um and so I really liked that I really like to talk about that. So. Brains are new, so we have to address to our new brain, I guess. <laughs> hey, if you're with us and you're um, listening in, please feel free to drop questions in the chat. Um, we definitely want to answer the things that you're thinking about as well. Because um, I know Missy's dropping a lot of gems over here. I'm like, so I know that our audience is learning a lot too. So please, please, please don't be shy. Put your questions in the chat and we will answer them. Yes. Um, I just want to kind of, on 
that same subject, but like moving over a little bit. When it comes to like the brain and um, the neural education piece, how, Missy, do you see um, us supporting educators in that sense of belonging, sense of belonging piece, specifically around well being and equity? So, when we talk about well being, when we talk about equity, sometimes like during COVID, people got, let's start with well-being. I just want to think about well-being first and then we'll move into equity. During COVID, um, we were isolated and we, at first it felt good, right? It was like, yes, I don't have to deal with all this stuff. I could just get my work done. And then all of a sudden it didn't feel good anymore. That's because we were missing that companionship with our students, with our colleagues. And so um, we would, when we came back together and we had this, this, these feelings of depression or anxiety or we were having a hard time sleeping like the list goes on i've talked to so many educators oh my gosh like all these things now that i'm that i'm that i'm um, working through and the solution to everybody was go get self-care just go get self-care and the thing about that is that started really annoying people like don't no, don't tell me to go get self-care because basically what you're saying is go carve even go try go attempt to carve time out as an educator with all the things that you're doing we work late into the night now you're telling me i need to go and get a massage like that sounds delightful and that's just not going to fit into my day and what we realized though as we, what we realized as we started um really diving into the, the neuroscience research was that um Self-care um, is self by yourself. That was the problem. We were isolated. And so the power of collective care, it feels so good to go talk to somebody about what's going on in, in your life, right? You feel refreshed when you go for a walk with a friend. That's because that's collective care. So we really need to, when we talk about well-being, we need to be thinking about what is that collective care? not just for us, but also our students and our families, um, our community members. Uh, thinking about equity, we gotta go to the brain again. There is a part of the brain. It is called the reticular activating system. It's right here at the base of the brain. It's a filter. And it's, I'll give you an example of a time that your reticular activating system um, brought stuff in that you hadn't seen before. If you ever went and bought a new car or bought a car, and maybe you bought a car you've never even heard of before, or you've never seen before, and now you're driving that new car around, and you're like, why does everybody have the same car? Like, was there a sale? What, what is going on? Your reticular activating system has determined that that car is important because it's your car now. So that gets through that particular activating system, you're not going to miss a single car. It's like people who drive Jeeps where they, you see people that drive Jeeps, they do like, they do something. I don't, I don't drive a Jeep. They don't miss each other. They don't miss a single Jeep that goes by. So that's what happens with our brains too. And oftentimes what our brain is looking for, that's what it lets through. So if if we think a student is on task and oh they're such a great kid they're always on task they're doing everything that's what our brain is going to look for and confirm if we th think a student can't pay attention can't sit can't read can't play well with others that's what our reticular activating system is going to allow to come in and that creates blind spots and when we have blind spots then we are not able to um, um, support the student in growing those neural connections. So it's one of those things where we got to first acknowledge implicit bias is a thing. It's a neuroscience, it's neurobiological. And we have a filter. And when we start pushing against that filter, we can allow other things in. So it, I'll, can I give you an example? Um, we do a lot of like, um, functional behavior analysis in schools where we say, oh, this kid, they're so bad, you gotta come in. And you do the FBA and it's just, all it is is documenting all the things that the kid is doing when they are dysregulated. It's all we're doing, dysregulation. Oh, yep, see it again, yep, see it again, Ooh, saw it again. And then all of a sudden we have this list that confirms us now. 
confirms us. Well, now it's really hard for us to start thinking about ways that we can support the kid because of the fact that all we're seeing are all these areas of unexpected behaviors or dysregulation. But if we go in looking for regulation, so sh shifting that, go in and look for the kid regulating on, on task, what are the things that, that they are doing? And when we notice dysregulation, really being intentional about what the, the um, antecedents were that led to that, right? When we can see, oh, this really regulates the kid. Oh, wow, they were really into this. Then we could start bringing those structures that invited the kid in in the first place into our classrooms with more intentionality. So you see that the kid, maybe not be, they're not sitting on the rug, but they're listening and they're writing notes down. Well, guess what? That's a, that's regulation for that child. And when teachers see that, then they're like, oh my gosh, the kid needs a notebook? Done. They all can have a notebook. So it's really kind of shifting that lens of looking for the deficit in the student versus looking and seeing um, their, their brilliance and their, um, their regulation and, and bringing them in and, and really, um, Dr. Stembridge, Dr. Adeyemi Stembridge, by his book, by the way, Culturally Responsive Education, he calls them engagement traps. Like, what are the things that we can bring in that the kid's not gonna be able to resist? Does he love Pokemon or magic cards? Or does she love, um, uh, I don't even know, it's not coming to my brain now, but what what is it that the kids are interested in? Be intentional, we'll make those engagement traps in your classroom and then you're gonna see more regulation. Missy, I was trying to over here trying to hold back the hallelujah claps because when I tell you like that is like from the beginning the analogy of the car and which I find it so funny because I currently want a new car and I feel like before I saw this car online I never saw it I'm seeing it everywhere now and I'm like I don't even want to get it anymore because I see that <laughs> But it's like so true. And I just love, love, love that. First of all, I love that analogy. And I love how you pointed out that this is our brain. This is a brain thing. Like it really all goes back to the brain. And I really love that. And I think one of the things when going back to positive uh, reinforcements, like that is the key. And this is the science behind it. Like she's telling y'all the science behind it We're, we don't just come and tell you all these things just for fun but like if we focus on those positive things and one of the things that like i like to always ask when we're doing pd with culture is this a teacher problem or is this a kid problem is it to make the teacher feel safe or is it you know just is it a safety thing in general like what is it why are you setting the expectation that you want to set where does where does these where do the expectations come from and are those expectations led with bias and i think that that was a perfect example of how our brains can make things that you know the kid's doing something wrong but no the kid is doing what, exactly what you asked it looks different than everybody else but it is compliant because as the kid to write the kid is writing He's trying standing up and everybody else is sitting down. And I just think that, you know, it's really beautiful to see how, you know, we all deal with these different things and for all these are all things that we're working on to try to fix. Um, but going back to what you're saying, the brain is plastic, like these are things that we can learn and relearn. It doesn't have to stay, you know, just like that, because that's what we think is best we can learn different ways to accommodate our students in different ways and i think that's the key of things like restorative practices and seeing um and using circle time maybe building circle, circle to understand perspectives um from multiple people and learning from those from those perspectives and refiltering our brain in that the part of our what's it called i just what can you say for me again missy Reticular activating system, we call it RAS for short. I don't be telling everybody about that RAS. <laughs> like, uh 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 uh, uh, uh. That's that RAS. Gotta filter it out. Let me filter it out. <laughs> That's going to be. That's my new thing. Oh my gosh. I'm so happy that you shared that. Like, I was really trying to hold 
on the back. I was like, yeah, I want to get up and start shouting, but <laughs> <laughs> let me let her finish talking so the audience can hear. <laughs> oh, man. Jasmine, do you have anything you want to add to that? I mean, oh, that was great. I mean, you guys, yeah, you guys hit everything. I think <laughs> being able to find the good and the bad is just so important and it's easy to say, but hard to do. Um, so really focusing on that in all situations in life, education, you know, personal friendships, um, just relationships in general, it's key. So I loved everything you both, both said, so. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Missy, as we come to a close, like our last kind of thing that I, ooh, I can't even see, um, that I wanna um, just talk about is like, what are the resources available? How can you help you know, teachers, students, and, you know, what's the best way that that they can take what they're learning from us here to you know, and apply to, you know, Ed and vice versa? So um, you can come to neuraleducation.org. We have our website. We have lots of, you know, trainings. We have book studies. We do all, all these things. It's grassroots effort um, for educators, by educators. So we are posting new things all the time. We have an upcoming event um, at PLU. PLU, um, we've been partnering with them since 2017, so shout out to Lutz. Um, but um, it'll be at PLU February 1st through the 3rd. Neuroscience of Attention, three-day event for ed educators. So we'd love to have you there. And then um, we're on all the socials. So just follow us. We are posting things um, as often as we can. We're all educators too in the field, so we're doing as much as we can. But we're not a curriculum company. We're not. We don't have tons of people out there that are just making it all happen. We are doing it because we're inspired to, and we want to bring that to other educators because the safety for the kids is really important. And you know what? It's really important for the educators too because if we're not able to open our brains up for business, then to bring in all those co-created ideas that are going to support students are going to be um, hard to find because we're not accessing the area of the brain that does that. And then can I say one more thing, Destiny? You can say it as much as you want. <laughs> to finish us off. So um, <laughs> I'm a mega fan of my niece. I already told you about her. And um, she, was, she was pushed out. She was a high school dropout. And um, she she got her GED and went back to school and became a registered nurse. And during COVID, she was one of the nurses, the registered nurses in the ICU COVID units. So we wanna talk about human potential. Could you imagine if we missed out on her potential during that time? We needed more of her and she, um, she's just such an inspiration. Everything that I do and I think about, I come back to her. And we as educators all have that person. Who is that person that just inspires you, that makes you go, you know, that, help, that helps you work harder when you're exhausted, helps you do the data on the Friday afternoon when you're just done? If you have that person in your brain, it's pretty amazing how you can open your brain up for business. That is. And I, I want to come. I mean, I don't even know your needs, but I want to come in the resilience of this as well, Missy, because the dignity that was that was once attempted to be taken away from her, and you know, making her feel like she was less than, and had, and unfortunately, made her to drop out. She was able to take that struggle, re put it back within herself, and then so many more people and treat them with all the dignity that was once attempted to take away from her somebody else during that time because we all know that that COVID time was really difficult without those nurses and those doctors you know, and more even more lives than where where taken could have been gone so shout out to Mrs. Nees what's her name let's shout her oh we all can't give her name thank you for all that you do um nurses are definitely top in my hero book teachers nurses doctors <laughs> We need you. So, <laughs> shout out to Well, guys, it's about time that we wrap up our chit chat for tonight. Thank you for everyone who joined in. Please um, follow us on all our socials. 
Instagram, Facebook, follow NeuroEd on all their socials, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn. Um, keep up with them. If you all would like to um, contact information, feel free to DM us and we can send you Miss Way. Or if you want to talk with us, feel free to DM us and we'll come your way. So <laughs> thank you all so much for tuning in. Please share with your friends. The video um, will be uploaded to YouTube and streaming starting next week. Um, Every week we'll, we'll upload the next video. So once it's come out, please feel free to share and send it to the educator who you feel like needs this. Um, there was a lot shared tonight. And thank you so, so, so much for coming on and being a part of this tonight. Yes, thank you. It was awesome learning about everything. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Y'all have a good night. Bye. Have a culture. Have a culture.